Hi there friends, we just had Profit for an hour episode talking about all the latest new features around Windows Virtual Desktop in the Azure portal. Hi Dean, hi Christian, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here to talk about all the latest things that we have done in the portal. And Pravithra just shared some of those latest things around the portal, DR planning, security, and how it's going to improve WVD for you. Join us because we're starting right now. Hi there friends and welcome to another episode of Desktops in the Cloud, your technical driven video podcast with guest speakers from Microsoft Engineering and as well the worldwide virtual desktop communities. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting Desktops in the Cloud, which you can do by clicking on that subscribe button and sharing our videos with others. If you want to be in one of our episodes, ping us on social media or our website desktopsinthecloud.com. So this new episode is all around the Azure portal and Windows Virtual Desktop with Pavitra, one of the Windows Virtual Desktop engineering program managers out of Redmond. So hi Pavitra, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing good, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, it's great, uh, great to have you and to yeah, be another voice of the Windows Virtual Desktop engineering team on our show. We had a lot of other uh, guests already, so it's great to uh, to have you and. Let's kick off with something because we are, we are working closely together as part of our role uh, within Microsoft. But yeah, the people that are like looking to this uh, this episode and and, and tuning in don't really know what your role within uh, Microsoft is and what your responsibilities are within the WVD team. So can you share a little bit more about yourself and your role within Microsoft? Sure. So um, I'm a technical program manager in the Windows Virtual Desktop team, and my role is essentially to collect customer requirements, understand existing customer problems, and see how we can add features and functionality into the service so that we can relieve you know customers from um, having you know big issues. Um, specifically, I work on you know admin um, related uh, functionality, so I uh, drive the uh, portal functionality essentially. So I work very closely with you as well as customers getting feedback on you know what needs to be added, what works, what doesn't work, etc. I also take care of geographical distribution, any kind of uh, scalability that we need to do for the service. That's also something that I take care of. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of responsibilities and. The Windows Virtual Desktop service has been developed from like the classic version to now the uh, the ARM-based version. We will talk more about that later on as well and show something around that. But as part of recent announcements, uh, this week uh, we saw something happening on the Azure government side. Um, can you share a little bit more about that, uh, what that means in terms of WVD? So I'm very excited to say that we are generally available in the Azure government, in the US Azure government cloud. And uh, we have been in public preview since end of August. Um, and it's taken a while for us to make sure that the customers who are validating it um, you know, have a good experience and are able to have successful deployments. And now we have gone GA, that means customers can now have production deployments and expect support. Um, from Azure around Windows Virtual Desktop in US Gov. Yeah, that's that's what probably one like number one item in like the public sector list. Um, so a lot of customers that were like um, early adopters of WVD, they have been using like the non-ARM based version of Windows Virtual Desktop, which was more like PowerShell heavy. Um, can you share something with our viewers, how they can leverage the new ARM-based uh, version, or also known as the Spring Update, back in uh, like a couple of months, how they can leverage that and migrate to the new ARM-based version with a, like a migration tool that you are, or your team is developing? Sure, so Windows Virtual Desktop Classic, um, otherwise known as non-ARM Windows Virtual Desktop, has been around for a while now. And um, some of the feedback we got from customers was they want to use native Azure role-based access control. They want to be able to publish user groups, um, sorry, app groups to user groups, etc. And the easiest way for us to add functionality, which customers wanted these specific kinds of functionality, was uh, for us to actually 
have a tight integration into Azure using Azure Resource Manager framework. And hence, we um, you know, almost built from scratch the um, ARM-based integration. And one of the happiest side effects of that was that we are now able to offer um, Azure portal integration for complete uh, deployment configuration and management of the Windows Virtual Desktop environment. And with that, of course, you are able to now set um, our back for your admins, you're able to publish app groups to users as well as user groups, and you're able to diagnose, monitor, as well as do VM management all from the same one uh, plane of management, which is the Azure portal. Uh, so now it's like Windows Virtual Desktop is now truly part of Azure, and you're able to, you know, leverage other services around Azure, um, you know, complementing Windows Virtual Desktop. Yeah, that's that's amazing, and yeah, we 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 can sort of dream that experience already because we do that like like daily, but not everybody has seen that uh, yeah, new portal experience yet, and some of the other. Uh, yeah, main improvements that uh, your team did uh, to address like customer feedback and to make the deployment easier. So can you level set the audience a little bit and share some of the main improvements and maybe show something as well about that? Sure. All right. So we went uh, public in GA with the Azure portal a couple of months back. Since then, we have had a lot of uh, conversations with our community, you know, be it our field, be it the you know, global black belts who are talking to customers on a daily basis or the actual customers providing feedback through our internal communities as well as through tech community. And so based on that, uh, some of the things that we have added, and we will continue to add a lot more features, but some of the things that we have added are, um, you, know, you know, now you're able to have a you know consistent way of renaming your session desktop. So if you have a desktop app group you're able to rename it and it will stay right there um, earlier there was a pretty big disconnect between how PowerShell did the you know renaming of session desktop and how portal did but based on all the feedback we went and updated the portal to reflect exactly how PowerShell works and also it's a little more intuitive for customers the second thing that we did which was actually a pretty big deal was that um, customers were unable to change the uh, VM image once they deployed VMs as part of a host pool. Um, this was quite a big obstacle for customers because they have to do constant VM management. They have to do update. They have to update the image of the VMs. They might have to create new VMs with different prefixes, especially if the name of the prefix, um, name of the VM is, you know, uh, greater than I think 15 characters, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have made improvements so that customers can actually change the VM image, VM prefix, um, and VM location on every ad VM workflow. And uh, this one just got released a couple of weeks ago, but it's pretty exciting because customers can do that. And you know, this was directly based on the customer feedback. So if you can see my screen now, um, the, I, I have got a you know existing host pool right here. So I'm going to click on that. And the way we did this was we um, basically just wanted to make sure that the existing values that are shown as part of the ad VM template um, at VM, you know, workflow are editable. That was, you know, not necessarily simple, but then we wanted to make sure that it's simple enough for customers can uh, to, you know, perform this action. Um, just give me a minute. I just need to generate a regd, which will allow these VMs to be added to the host pool. It should take just a couple of seconds to uh, get created, and then we should be able to add a VM. All right, so if you go to the add VM um, workflow, um, of course, you cannot change anything related to the host pool. But then when you come to the uh, virtual machine blade, you can see that now I can change the prefix, which is not available earlier. Second thing is I can change the um, image type anytime I want to, as well as the actual image. I can go and, you know, look at any other images that I have in my shared image gallery or, you know, use another gallery image. I can go and change anything I want to as far as the image itself is concerned. And of course, I can change the virtual network because especially if you're, you know, setting up set of VMs, 
um, with um, you know DR maybe disaster recovery you might want to create the VMs in a completely different location and if I do create it in a different location I will need to create it with a different virtual network so you can do all of these things uh, we also have a convenient way for you to add firewall settings so you can you know just click here and make sure that you have all the information and add it to any new virtual network that you have got um, so you're able to do all of these things as part of the add VM workflow the one thing that I do want to point out here though is that we have specifically um, made the uh, VM size button uneditable and the reason for this is that if it's a personal desktop host pool it's a you know it's a different issue but quite a lot of our customers have pool desktop host pools and the first thing that um, you know they they generally do is as part of the host pool type if you select pool you have load balancing and when you have load balancing you also especially with depth first load balancing you have maximum sessions that uh, you can host per VM and that is set by the customer if they code change the sizes of VMs later on they might not realize that this is going to be detrimental to the user management and the user experience might actually be really bad after changing the VM size and hence we have um, we have consciously chosen not to change the VM size as part of the add VM workflow. We do have feedback the customers would like to do it, so we are looking at alternate ways of doing, um, providing the functionality not to the add VM workflow. So that is uh, one of the things that we did. The other thing that we also got feedback on was that you know if you have um, a, a lot of sessions on a particular session host. So let me go to one particular. Um, host pool here so I have a host pool I have sessions on um, the session host in the host pool and basically customers would like to do management of both active and disconnected sessions on session hosts earlier we were not able to provide it we were only able to provide session management for active sessions but now you are able to disconnect um, you know disconnect sorry uh, if you have disconnected sessions you will be able to see it in the session um, host blade you are able to you know log off users etc even though they are disconnected this was actually a pretty important ask for customers because the number of sessions on a session host is going to be aggregated over active sessions and disconnected sessions and if we only show active sessions customers just cannot understand exactly why a certain um, number of users are not able to load get load balanced on a particular session host so this kind of closes that uh, loop for them and now they are able to um, manage both active and disconnected sessions yeah, that's great stuff. I, I like to, to always see how the, the portal is constantly improving and how the PG is listening to everyone's feedback to just improve the experience. And speaking of which, one of the things that we've had in the past for configuring all of those host pool properties, the, the RDP properties, has been all through PowerShell. But recently, we've added that to the portal. Can you go through some of that for us? Oh, yes, definitely. So. Um, again, this was direct feedback from customers. So when we first went live with the portal, we actually had a simple blade with RDP properties. But two things we discovered from that was essentially, um, it was actually just another tab here which said properties and then we had basic and then there was RDP properties. First and foremost, customers could not discover it. And secondly, it was very, very limited. We only had redirection properties. We didn't have anything other than the redirection properties. And so what customers wanted was they wanted every single property that WBD supports uh, listed and they also wanted it to be more discoverable. So what we uh, did was we re-engineered it, redesigned it and now we have a brand new blade which has all the RDP properties that WBD supports. Um, so you know it's pretty easy for customers to go through. We have bucketed all the properties into different categories and so it's easy for you to discover exactly what kind of property you want and you don't have to go through any of the PowerShell or uh, command line based properties. But let's say that you still want to do that. We have provided a way if you go to advanced for you to actually set properties. So if you are more used to uh, you know, having command line properties, you can do that also, and this will get reflected in the back end. The other uh, you know, interesting thing is that when we went live with this, there were a couple of issues based specifically around usability more than anything else. Um, 
and within a week we were able to get all the feedback from customers and you know deploy a fix so that now customers uh, can use it as intuitively as possible and it is as close to the behavior as they um, expect. That's great. Um, going back to something else that you were saying earlier about uh, being in the ARM portal and how that has helped us to align better with Azure, uh, Azure services. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I talk to customers quite often about is on their identity security and specifically around conditional access. And I understand that setup is different than what people might be used to in classic. So can you walk through some of that and explain the, the nuances there? Oh yeah, definitely. All right, so conditional access is definitely one of the most important things that we offer as part of Azure security and Windows Virtual Desktop completely makes use of it, as has been you know seen uh, with the Windows Virtual Desktop classic environments. And so here I have got conditional access set up already for um, the ARM environment, and I'm going to show you what the differences are going to be between classic and uh, ARM. So one of the major differences is the actual application ID. So the first thing that you're going to be doing as part of setting up conditional access is to set up the you know specific users or user groups that have access to it. And here I have a user group that's already set up that has access to this sorry, on which this conditional access policy is supposed to work on. The second thing that you do is generally go and select what are the different applications that you want. Um, this conditional access policy to be associated with and so i have selected a conditional uh, app, so an app already but if you actually search for windows virtual desktop you will see more than one application that's available so if you uh, you know ame right here and client these two are applications that are associated with the classic WVD. So for classic WVD, you will have to actually select both AME and client. So the AME application ID is essentially important for all your um, native clients. So Windows, Android, iOS, Mac, etc. will all use the AME client policies. Um, whereas the HTML5, the web-based uh, client, will be using this particular app ID, which is Windows Virtual Desktop Client. In the ARM environment, though, we only need one application ID, which is the Windows Virtual Desktop. And that one starts with 9C. By the way, all of this is part of our documentation, so you don't have to you know, uh, look at the app ID. All you have to do is go through our documentation, search the app ID, and you'll be able to get that. So all we will need is this one application. And once you have that application, you basically go to conditions. And then um, you select on client apps. And this is where you're going to be selecting where this particular condition is going to apply. So if you select browser, that means your HTML5 or web page client is the only place where this conditional access policy is going to be applied. But if you select mobile apps and desktops, that means when you're connecting through Windows client or iOS or Mac or Android, all of those will also have the same policy applied. This way, you can have one policy for both browser and uh, native apps, or you can have separate for browser and native apps. It's totally up to you. But this is the major difference. You don't have two client app, uh, you don't have two app IDs, but you are able to uh, differentiate between policies based on the client app that is already linked to the server app that you select. So this is the uh, major difference between what we did with Windows Virtual Desktop Classic and being a true first-party service, having just one app. Yeah, I like that app because in the uh, even in some other applications that, that I help to support, you know, the, the conditional access story is a little more, uh, what I'll say is a disconnected, kind of like the AME and the Classic, where you've got separate ones you have to have for separate applications. I, I love that it's now unified and makes it easier for the user and, and they can customize it how they like. On a uh, slightly different track, there was a recent doc that was uploaded to uh, the Azure documentation page for WVD on DR planning. And of course, uh, I covered a video on this uh, recently on the Azure Academy as well. So I'd like you, Pravithra, to share some of your insights into the BCDR side of WVD and how we're aligning with the Azure Site Recovery team and as well as the Azure Backup team. 
Oh yeah, definitely. So disaster recovery, right? When we first went live with Windows Virtual Desktop, we were more interested in making sure customers have good functionality. They are able to, you know, deploy, configure, and manage Windows Virtual Desktop and optimize it to as much as possible with just their environment. But now we are, you know, moving away from being a new service. We are becoming a more mature service uh, with customers who have been around for more than a year with us. And so the most important thing, the next step for them is to understand how they can you know have high availability set up what kind of disaster recovery um, planning they would need to do and so we have been getting a lot of asks from customers as to what recommendations the team has got the service has got for them to take into consideration as part of disaster recovery planning we have a great alignment with the Azure Site Recovery team because they have a lot of um, you know, technical expertise on what are the different tooling that's available, what are the different things that Azure Site Recovery has actually done to you know, ease the whole disaster recovery setup. And so um, alongside with the Azure Site Recovery team, we worked on this documentation and uh, we have covered all the important things that you need to take into consideration in the environment, not just the service, not just the VMs, but everything around the uh, VMs that are important for customers to set up disaster recovery and high availability on. So um, Windows Virtual Desktop by itself as a service already, you know, has to support disaster recovery high availability given the fact that we are an Azure service we cannot even go live without supporting it so if there is a region outage we are already built in to be able to support you with continuing with the user sessions with your admin management etc but the vm side is completely in the customer's control and the vm the compute side essentially you know uh, takes into consideration the identities which customer kind of forget sometimes identities domain controller um, the VM is actually the, the easiest thing that you know you can set up uh, high availability on and um, the the most other the other important part is the user profiles and the app dependencies so if you have VMs that are running in a, you know in a secondary region you would still need application and application data to be available and also the application backend to be available so um, the document goes into all the different things that you need to take into consideration and the available tools that Microsoft offers um, for customers to make use of that we are also working, you know, we have a continuous uh, integration with the Azure Site Recovery team, where we are trying to see if we can uh, we can make this process a little more seamless. Um, but the start, the start to all of these things is getting the doc out into the hands of customers so they can start the planning. Um, ASR already supports quite a lot of these um, information, though it might have to be a little manual at, at this point, but it's a good start. Well, that's definitely the. The, the way to succeed, you put it out there, have people test, iterate, and especially provide feedback. And I know that uh, you and the rest of the PG are very interested in, in everyone's feedback. So how can people uh, get in touch with you, maybe on social media, to give you some of that info? Um, they should be using our uh, tech community for them to give us feedback. And they can definitely use user voice if they want to get feedback. I'm also on LinkedIn and I do see a lot of customers, you know, reaching out, some partners reaching out, especially if they want to provide feedback. But uh, the best place for them to have any kind of feature support or, um, uh, you know, technical issues being discussed would be tech community and user voice. And all of these references by are there in our documentation and they should definitely be able to use that. Sounds good. Thanks, Bariatha, for joining us today, and thank you for watching the Desktops in the Cloud today. Be sure that you click that like button and the notification bell, and maybe even provide us some comments on what you'd like to see on a future episode. And don't miss the latest, because there's always more to come. We'll see you next time.